right, thanks for coming out to hear me uh, on this afternoon, this chilly afternoon. Uh, this is my first visit here. Uh, it's a lovely campus. I'm really impressed. I love the big globe, especially. That's like a, a wonderful landmark. It, you know, it made it real easy to find, which is great. Um, yeah, so um, we've all read a lot about Facebook and thought a lot, about, a lot about Facebook. And even if you don't use Facebook, um, it's been on our minds and, um, uh, and a subject of conversation for the better part of two years uh, with some extra intensity in 2018. Now, you might want to credit me with planning this, but that's not exactly what happened. I, you could say I got lucky by deciding to publish a book in 2018 about Facebook. Um, and I think that's mostly true, but it's been wacky and crazy and kind of maddening um, to have this roiling conversation going on with the book out there. So yeah, it's great for like, you know, I, I love people paying attention to me and asking me for uh, insight on what's going on. All that's great, wonderful for the ego, not so bad for the paycheck. It's pretty good, right? But uh, at the same time, like everything is crazy with Facebook. Everything is confusing, everything is changing, right? So here I, I put, you know, a couple hundred pages in binding, hoping that it would uh, sort of answer the question, describe the situation for years to come, because what's the point of writing a book if it's not supposed to explain things for years to come? And I'm not sure that the book is going to do the job even a year from now. And I blame Facebook for that, right? Because everything has been so crazy, right? Okay, so how did, it, how did this even happen? I didn't want to write this book. I didn't plan to write this book. You know, most books that I've written, and I think most books that most professors write, are years in the making. They require um, you know, deep research, uh, archival research, or field work, or experiments in a lab. And, um, and, they, and they require you know, deep analysis of a subject, uh, bringing in years of um, the existing literature in the field, right? And, it's, and they're carefully built up over what is probably supposed to be four years, because that's what you tell your editor, but it usually ends up being five or six years, right? Um, and and it's, it's, that's a whole other process, right? And that's how I've written every other book. But this one was a little bit weirder. So uh, this is how it happened. I had been teaching a class called Privacy and Surveillance. I've been teaching it for many years. I taught it at uh, UVA Law School. I taught it to undergraduates at UVA. Um, I taught a version of it at NYU years ago when I taught at NYU. Uh, and of course, it changes all the time because the issues about our, our different threats to our privacy and uh, different modes of surveillance change all the time. And it's been a blast to teach because every time I teach it, I have to change it. And that keeps me on my toes. And that's kind of exciting. Uh, but because it's constantly changing, I have to keep um, you know, constantly updating my notes and updating what I want my students to read. So I have a, a file. I don't know if you've, you've, if you've used Evernote. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an app and it's a platform. And it works on a tablet and on a phone. And, and, and it's a web-based thing. And anytime you come across an article that's interesting, you can just click on a little thing and it saves it to Evernote under the right tag. So I had all of this stuff saved about Facebook. Because Facebook was a big part of what I teach and privacy and surveillance, but I never, never planned to write a book on it. I had written a book and published a book in 2011 called The Googleization of Everything, and that drove me crazy because I had spent years researching and writing about a fast-moving, very wealthy, very powerful technology company, and every month it would do something different, and every month I had to figure out if it was important, whatever they did was important, and, and I had to like, get back in and change the book. Um, and that dragged on for years. Uh, I ended up being like two years late on that uh, submission of my manuscript. So I said I would never do that again. Like I was never gonna try to take on a big, rich company like that. Well, I ended up doing it. Uh, and here's why. Um, I don't know if you remember, but like something big happened in November of 2016. Um, and uh, like many people, I was stunned. I was baffled. I was depressed. I was scared. And um, like many of my friends, I wanted to talk to other people who were feeling the same things. Fortunately, I had a friend uh, who uh, was a magazine editor in New York who had decided to take like a, uh, a trip around the East Coast visiting old friends to have conversations about, okay, like what's going to happen to our country now? What just happened to our country? What didn't we understand about our country? All these big questions, right? So he's visiting me in Charlottesville. 
we go out to dinner. We're having uh, drinks back at my house. Uh, my wife, a good friend of mine, were there. And um, he starts asking me, like, how did Trump manage to flip the Electoral College just right? Like, because if you think about it, right, the reason that Donald Trump is president right now is because of three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Those are three states that should have gone to Hillary Clinton, and all the polls indicated that they would for a long time. Uh, and that was, those were really the three surprise states, right? Florida went to Trump by uh, 110,000 votes, and that, you know, that was pretty close, uh, but we knew Florida could go either way. But the other three were supposed to be Clinton states, and by the way, those three states, those are big states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. The three states flipped to Trump by a total of 80,000 votes across three states. More people can fit in the Penn State University football stadium. More people can fit in the University of Michigan football stadium. That's about as many people as fit in the University of Wisconsin football stadium. Flipped the entire election. The fate of NATO, the fate of world trade, the fate of General Motors, apparently. Um, all flipped by, by 80,000 votes across three big states. Now, how in the world did the Trump campaign know that they could and know that they should work on those three states, and how do you move just enough voters over to you know, basically surprise everyone? And look, nobody, even the Trump campaign, thought that this was going to work. It was, a, it was a complete desperation play. But what they did, and I happen to know this because I had been reading deeply about Facebook for years. The Trump campaign had no professional campaign staffers. Nobody who was a veteran of Republican campaigns wanted to work for the Trump campaign uh, in 2016. They all ran. The person with the most political experience the Trump campaign could hire was a gentleman named Paul Manafort, who had not run a campaign in the United States since 1996. Uh, and basically didn't know what he was doing, and we see how that worked out. Um, but what did, he, what did he have? He had a bunch of people who worked for his business, for the Trump Organization. And the people he brought in to work on the campaign happened to run the digital and social media marketing and advertising efforts of the Trump Organization. You know, that's how they sold the Trump stakes. That's how they sold Trump University. That's how they got people to come into the casinos until the casinos went bankrupt. It's hard to run a casino into the ground, by the way. Like, it's a business that should have money coming in. Really, only one person's ever failed to run a casino and make money. Um, OK, so, so but these people, right, beginner's mind, right? They don't know what they're doing in terms of politics, and that works for them. Because politics has traditionally, right, running a national campaign has traditionally been about spending a lot of money in big cities to put out expensive television ads to a lot of people a broadcast method, message, right? You want to move the state of Florida from one candidate to the other, you buy ads in Orlando and Jacksonville and Miami and, and Tallahassee, and then you blanket the state, and you give a message that appeals to the great middle of Florida voters, hoping that you energize people, make them feel good about your candidate, right? Standard stuff, but like play to the middle. Because you put something on TV, Anybody can watch it. It's really hard to really carefully target a television ad. You know, you can pick an ad on Fox News versus an ad on MSNBC, and that's about the extent of targeting you can do. You know, maybe ESPN gets a different audience than Lifetime. But again, that's not very precise, because the TV's on all the time in all kinds of people's households. So it's an inefficient way. Plus, when you buy an ad on TV, you have no feedback. You don't know if people actually like the ad at that moment, whether it moves them to act at that moment. There's no feedback for television ads, or for radio ads, or for newspaper ads. And they're really expensive. And not only are they expensive, you don't know if they're effective. So advertising for any product or any candidate for a couple centuries has been really inefficient to the point where it's basically a faith-based activity, right? You, 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 you believe what your ad people tell you about what works and what doesn't. They run focus groups before they run this stuff. It's a very slow process. And if you uh, put out an ad, you have to hope it works, but you get no immediate data, no immediate response, no way of knowing if what you did was right. Maybe if you tweaked it a little bit, changed a sentence, changed a word, it would have worked. You don't know that, but you do if you spend all that money on Facebook instead of television. And that's what the Trump campaign did. 
couple of reasons. One, Donald Trump is really cheap. He doesn't like spending money, and he didn't want to spend any campaign money. Plus, he thought he was going to lose, so why spend a lot of money? Right? And he had a lot less money to spend than Hillary Clinton did. So Hillary Clinton's buying ads in all these states, even states she was unlikely to win, states like Arizona and Texas, she was buying ads. Right? And so the, the word we got from the people who have, are veterans about covering political campaigns was, oh my gosh, Hillary Clinton is spreading the map. She's adding states that were not in play before. This is going to cost, because like, standard practice tells you this is going to cost Republicans a lot of money. They're going to have to spread the map as well. This means Hillary Clinton expects to run up the score in the Electoral College. That was the story we were getting as late as October. Well, again, out of desperation, what does the Trump campaign do? They, they use Facebook as Facebook is designed to be used. So Facebook knows everything about you. That doesn't surprise you, right? Facebook knows everything about you even if you're not a Facebook user. Even if you're not a Facebook user, they know your name, they know where you live, they probably know what you do, they know a lot about your politics, they know a lot about the, uh, the kind of shoes you like. How do they know this? A couple of ways. Number one, if you've ever been a Facebook user or you've ever been an Instagram user, then they have a whole lot of data on you, even if you quit. And they never close that dossier. They always supplement it with more information. And even if you're not, if you're no longer an active user of Facebook or Instagram, they're tracking you every time you use your phone or every time you use a computer that you've used before, like a web browser that you've used before. The other way they know you is they have been for years purchasing the same consumer information that every other marketing company and advertising company in the world has been using. Uh, uh, databases that come from the credit card industry, databases that come from the uh, direct marketing industry um, that, that have particular profiles of you based on the magazines you subscribe to or the catalogs you have shopped with or, um, or the, if you have a, a, a loyalty card at a supermarket they know exactly what kind of products you buy. If you start buying baby formula and diapers, they know what's happening in your life, right? That sort of indication is really important. They also, of course, know your zip code, et cetera, which is a pretty good proxy for uh, your uh, socioeconomic status, perhaps even your race. And that all feeds into their, their dossier on you. So Facebook knows everything about everybody in the country, actually almost everybody in the world. I'll get to that in a minute, right? So what Facebook will offer you if you want to buy ads, like if you're the Trump campaign, but oh, by the way, the Trump campaign had Facebook staff working in the office with them, like embedded in the office with them. Uh, Facebook offered Clinton the same uh, service and the Clinton campaign said, no, no, we got this, don't worry about it. Probably a big mistake, but, um, right, so, so what do they do? They, they can, they can pick out in any particular place a way to structure an ad that is designed to appeal to any demographic slices. In one case, and we know this because the Trump campaign boasted about it, in South Florida, there are a lot of voters of Haitian descent. And we know that in general, there were a lot of men who had voted for Democrats in the past, including Obama in the past, who were wary of voting for a woman for president. So you've got that possibility, and you've got this other inter like possibility of men being able to be turned off from voting for Hillary Clinton, that, and that's true across all racial and ethnic groups. And then you've got the possibility of, and this is really interesting, a large number, a couple of hundred thousand men of Haitian descent who live in South Florida. Well, what do you do if you would like to turn off just a few thousand of them who are likely to vote for a Democrat running for president, but you want to discourage them from voting. Just make them stay home, which is as good as getting a vote for your, for your candidate, really. Well, what you do in that case is you run ads saying, hey, remember the last big earthquake in Haiti when Bill Clinton went down there and made all kinds of big promises about how everything would be rebuilt and nothing was ever rebuilt and things got worse? Remember that? Well, that's a really good way to create a negative emotion a negative response among a small group of voters in South Florida. And there's reason to believe, because the Trump campaign uh, you know, measured the response, that, that it was clicked and shared on by a large number of people they targeted. So there was some response to that. So let's say there are 100,000 such voters, 5,000 or so decided not to vote. I'm just making up a number. Or decided not to vote for Hillary Clinton, maybe skip the president that time. 
Maybe even a handful of them voted for Donald Trump. Probably not, but you never know, right? But even that, right? Again, 5,000. Again, Florida was decided by 110,000 votes. So up north in Florida, they can do the same thing for people who have traditionally voted for Democrats but care a lot about gun rights, or people who have traditionally voted for Democrats who care a lot about abortion rights. You can, or, uh, or anti-abortion. You can like, you can, you can really carefully tailor your message to depress voter turnout for your opponent and increase motivation for the people who maybe aren't usual voters or regular voters, but might be energized to vote for Donald Trump this one time. And, and because Facebook is so inexpensive to use and you only pay if someone clicks on the ad, you can continuously experiment with different ads, different, different strings of words, different videos, different images, different color schemes, and see what works best. And they're just every day rolling out hundreds of ads to different people in different states all over the place. So why is this a problem for democracy? Nothing the Trump campaign did was nefarious. What they did was actually pretty smart, right? They, they managed to do a really cost-effective campaign that moved voters one way or the other, which is what you're supposed to do in a campaign. But the system itself is not good for democracy for the following reasons. Those ads, those Facebook ads, are invisible to the rest of us. If you didn't, if you were not targeted with that ad, you never saw that ad, you never can see that ad, you don't know what the Trump campaign said about itself or about America, or about Hillary Clinton, or about anything. Imagine, taking it out of that, imagine I'm running against you for city council. Uh, and uh, we are in a heated race. And I know that in the town where we live, there are a number of small business owners who over the years have complained about shoplifting. And I start using Facebook to carefully target ads at people who own businesses, small business owners, shop owners. And I say, you know what? My opponent is a shoplifter. And I run this ad and just target those people. You might, as my opponent, might never know that I called you a shoplifter. And there's no permanent record of me calling you a shoplifter. So there's no response. Now, if I bought a TV ad saying you're a shoplifter, that's all over the news. That's in the newspapers. People are saying, oh my gosh, Siva called the, his opponent a shoplifter. That's a big problem, right? And there's some sort of feedback to it. I have to pay a price for telling a lie like that. You don't have to do that on Facebook. There's no oversight, there's no response, there's no, there's no uh, feedback from the system. That's a big problem for democracy because in democracies, we're supposed to converse. We're supposed to, we're supposed to respond to each other, right? We're supposed to be able to test people's claims. We're supposed to hold people to the to the, uh, the veracity of their claims, right? We're supposed to be able to say that person told the truth and that person lied. And if you lie, you're supposed to pay some sort of price. But if you're buying all your ads on Facebook and you're doing your entire campaign on Facebook, there's no such feedback. There's no such consequence. So again, we don't know all that happened in the 2016 campaign. We do know that there were a number of forces active on Facebook spreading all sorts of nonsense, not only about Hillary Clinton, not only about Donald Trump, but about us, about what we might want as a country, about how much we might disdain and disrespect each other as a country. And a lot of those influences came from overseas. And we know this because the Mueller investigation has exposed these practices, and in fact, indicted people who are participating in it. We also know this because the Senate Intelligence Committee has revealed these ads, pulled them out of Facebook, required Facebook to, to deliver them to Capitol Hill, and has made them public. So we know much more about Russian interference in 2016 than we do about exactly what the Trump campaign did on Facebook. Now again, I don't think the Trump campaign did anything nefarious. I think Facebook set up a system that does not enhance democracy. I think Facebook set up a system that enhances advertising, and Facebook is an advertising company. Now, Facebook is huge. Why did I choose Facebook among all the other social media platforms? Because it's pretty much the only thing that matters. And I'll get to that in a while. Facebook matters more outside the United States than it does inside the United States. So while the conversation in my living room with my friend was about how Trump deftly used Facebook to flip three states to become president. And that's when my friend said, you need to write that book. And that's when my wife said, oh yeah, you need to write that book. Something she regrets to this day, by the way. Um, 
And that's why I wrote the book. And I wrote the book in a year, which I've never done before. And it's just, I was able to do it because I had all this research I had been piling up for years. Uh, I had been following all of my uh, friends and associates in the social media research arena who had been um, going around the world and studying the ways that Facebook and other social media platforms are being used in China, in Myanmar, in Kazakhstan, in the Philippines, in India. I had all this research that I'd been using for teaching. It was just stuck in my hard drive. And it made it possible for me to sort through and, and, and put it together in ch chapters in ways that I found way too easy. It was, it was, it was weird. But anyway, I, I was able to, to uh, write and, uh, and revise the book in a year. Um, so between November 2016 and November 2017, I did most of the work. Uh, and then the editing process was in the winter. And the book came out in June. Um, and then things got even weirder. Because ever since the book came out, Facebook's been in trouble. Um, and uh, not cause and effect, right? It wasn't because of my book. It's just Facebook got itself in trouble. It's made all sorts of, you know, the leaders of Facebook have made all sorts of bonehead errors uh, in their public relations and in their practices. Because almost everything that I put into this book, indicting Facebook for undermining democracy, turned out to be the subject of some real story in the world. Now, when I sat down in my living room and decided to write this book, the one thing I said to my friend and to my wife was, I don't want to write a book about Donald Trump and Facebook. I don't want to write a book about America and Facebook. Because the story is global. And in fact, the US got off easy. Most of what we read about is about when it comes to Facebook, is how Facebook has affected the United States. And the thing about the United States is our media ecosystem is actually pretty diverse. We don't have to use Facebook. We don't have to use WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook. We don't have to use Instagram. And a lot of people don't. But there are a lot of places in the world where you kind of have to, because it's all there is. Right? You want to learn about the world, and you live in the United States, you live in Western Europe, you live in Canada, you have a lot of options, a lot of better options. But again, in a lot of the world, those options are narrowing, and it's narrowing to Facebook. And there are a couple of reasons. But ultimately, when I look around the world, and I see the effect that Facebook's having on less established democracies than ours, I can only conclude that ultimately, Facebook is by design weakening democracy. That doesn't mean by intent. It's just so poorly designed to be used to learn about the world, to talk about the world, and to engage in politics that it inadvertently undermines democracy. And if you happen to watch what authoritarian leaders or leaders of nationalist movements around the world do, they love Facebook. They love Facebook and they love WhatsApp and to a lesser degree they love Instagram. Why? Because the particular elements and design choices that Facebook engineers made work for them. Here's the thing. What flies around Facebook? The things that fly around Facebook are the things that generate engagement. That's the term of art in Silicon Valley. Engagement. Clicks, likes, shares, comments. If you can post something on Facebook, and it can get a lot of clicks, shares, likes, and comments, then Facebook knows you have put out something that interests a lot of people, and interests specifically the people who are in your circle of friends. And that signal to Facebook is something Facebook learns from. Imagine that happening hundreds of millions of times a day all around the world. Facebook is constantly keeping score. That's why it offers you that little scoreboard at the bottom of every post. How many clicks, how, I mean, how many likes, how many shares, how many comments? That's a scoreboard for you, but more importantly, it's a scoreboard for Facebook. So Facebook knows the stuff that you post that flies and works and moves people, and it knows the stuff that you post that bores people and doesn't interest people. So what generates engagement? Well, we know this. Years and years of study. What kind of stuff gets the clicks, the shares, the likes, and the comments? Stuff that sparks strong emotions. Those emotions can be joy. Those emotions can be hate, hatred. Those emotions can be anger. They can include all sorts of passions. They can make you laugh. Right? That, it, any, any strong emotion works. What doesn't work? Deep thought, calm deliberation, measured debate, politeness. None of that flies. It's not that people hate that stuff. It's just that 
it's just good, it's not worth a comment, right? You say something utterly reasonable on Facebook, I, like why bother commenting? I've just yeah, that was utterly reasonable, right? Um, and that's exactly what ha what happens. So, if you're trying to stir things up, if you're trying to divide people, if you're trying to get people to hate a group of immigrants, if you're trying to get people to hate a group of people in your country who aren't immigrants, man, that system is perfect for you. Because you don't have to put up something that most people agree with to have it catch fire. In fact, just the opposite. Look, if I were to uh, get on Facebook later today and I were to write something outstandingly racist, like over the top racist, about some group, just make up something, right? And it's just so nasty and hateful. What would happen is I would get tremendous faith, uh, uh, um, uh, blowback, right? People would tell me how wrong I am. People would tell me how evil I am. People would say what harm I'm doing, right? The response would be tremendous. I would have hundreds of comments. And people would also do the following. They would share it to their own timeline and say, can you believe this guy? Can you believe he said this about this group? What a horrible person that person is. And every one of those reactions makes me stronger, right? Every one of those reactions sends my hateful post to more and more and more timelines and gives a signal to Facebook, this is the kind of stuff people are really into, right? Because Facebook's computers don't say, oh, that sounds pretty racist, we better dial it down. They're trying to get that developed, but that's years away, that sort of sensory method of artificial intelligence. They're working on that, they keep telling us. But man, it's hard. First of all, racism comes in all sorts of new ways and new packages of language all the time, all over the world. So there's just no way they're gonna keep up with the varieties of hatred in this, in this world, let alone this country, right? So, um, so, the, so, so basically, anytime you see something on Facebook that is over the top, crazy, hateful, conspiratorial, just plain wrong. The worst thing to do is tell people it's wrong. But that's what we're supposed to do, right? We're, we're, we're trained <laughs> from the very young age to respond to nonsense, right? To tell people that they're wrong, to explain to them why they're wrong, to argue with them, to call them out for their sins, right? That's, that's how we are supposed to react as sentient people, as intelligent people, as decent people. But that's the worst thing you can do on Facebook. And the people who are spreading this stuff know that, right? So uh, let's say I, I put out this crazy racist rant. And all my friends, soon to be ex-friends, because they're all going to unfriend me, all like respond to me and get mad at me. And some of them share it, right? So all of a sudden, this post ends up on thousands of news feeds all over the world. And I might be a bit humiliated at times. I might be, you know, I might lose my job, whatever. But uh, the post works, and it ends up in front of eyeballs that no one could predict or expect. And someone out there is going to go, well, that's a good point. I hate the star-bellied sneeches as well, right? Something like that. All it takes <laughs> out of those thousands of people who see the post is for one or two to go, huh, interesting, right? For it to do damage. So imagine all sorts of nonsense about health, right? Bad health news, Facebook's filled with bad health information, right? And that stuff comes from wacky websites with no oversight, no peer review or whatever, right? That stuff flies around Facebook too. And every time someone posts something wrong or stupid or dangerous about, about health, you get the same reaction. You don't know what you're talking about. You're gonna hurt people, this is terrible. And then boom, it's everywhere. And that kind of stuff has real ability to do harm in the world almost immediately, and it flies around Facebook. So that's one way that Facebook is designed to undermine deep thought of any value. Now, contrast that. If I, instead of writing some racist rant, I post an article from some serious magazine about a serious subject, like um, uh, the tariffs uh, that the president is proposing on the automobile industry. And it has quotes from economists and quotes from trade experts and quotes from diplomats. And it's very measured and very thoughtful and very important, right? It's gonna affect thousands of jobs in America. And it's thoroughly reasonable. Nobody's gonna care. 
right? Nobody's going to click. I mean, people might read it. My friends who are interested in it might read it. But no one's going to get worked up, up enough about it to do anything about it, to write a comment, to share it to a timeline, to put emojis on there. It's just like anything with any balance or thought or research. It drops like a stone on Facebook. So the very fact that we've decided to perform our politics on Facebook around the world is a terrible idea. But we're human. And as Aristotle reminds us, humans are political animals. And we can't help ourselves, right? So because all of this is a function of design, I argue that the problem with Facebook is Facebook. So every time you, t you hear a, uh, some horror story about uh, some effect of Facebook in the world, and then you have uh, people from Facebook quote and say, hey, we're working on that. Like, you know, we're working on this. Uh, artificial intelligence algorithm that's going to uh, be able to identify racist speech really early and like dial down its effect? Nah. First of all, like I said, that's years off. But more importantly, that doesn't, that doesn't do anything but curb problems at the margin. There are three things about Facebook that make Facebook Facebook and three things about Facebook that make the problem with Facebook Facebook. Number one is the scale. Facebook has 2.2 billion users around the world. 2.2 billion. Two, a two, and eight zeros. That's a huge, huge number. There are only 7.4 billion humans on Earth, and 2.2 billion of them use Facebook regularly. That's astounding. I don't know of anything else short of water and oxygen that touches that many people that regularly. Think about one company that knows everything about 2.2 billion people, that 2.2 billion people are constantly putting up photos, putting up videos, putting up, uh, putting up um, uh, expressions, putting up poetry, putting up jokes, right? Facebook can't track that. Facebook can't do anything about 2.2 billion people. It's just too big. It's just too big. Not only that, 2.2 billion people in more than 100 languages. And every month, Facebook adds languages. So look, Facebook tried this big effort to try to clean up its act for the election that we had earlier this month in this country. And it was a daunting task, 435 House races, 30-something Senate races, governor's races in like 25 states or more, right? There was a lot of work to do to make sure that Facebook was like watching over all these elections, making sure nonsense was kept to a minimum. And we don't know the score. We don't know how well it did. But it was trying to learn from its 2016 mistakes. But look, almost all of that stuff was in English. Some of it was in French. Some of it was in Spanish. Because those languages do exist in this country, Spanish especially in large numbers. But American politics is basically conducted in English. Next year, there's an election in India. India is the largest democracy in the world. India has 1.3 billion people in it. About a billion of them, yeah, short of, just short of a billion, are old enough to vote. Let's say 900 million people can vote. India has more than a dozen languages. The idea that somehow Facebook is going to manage the Indian election in any reasonable way is absurd. So scale. Second, algorithmic amplification. That thing I was describing where you post something and it gets a lot of reaction and it goes everywhere, that's how Facebook's algorithms are designed to amplify strong emotions. Algorithmic amplification. And the third thing is that advertising system that I described. The same advertising system that the Trump campaign used because it was all it knew how to use. But it's also the same advertising system that companies all over the world are starting to use because it makes sense, right? You're kind of stupid not to use it. It sends you your, your product, your service, your message right to the very people who are interested in you. You're trying to sell ostrich skin cowboy boots. You better not buy a ad on Sunday on NFL football because the number of people who, buy, who, want, who want ostrich and cowboy boots is pretty narrow. And the people who watch football, that's a pretty big group, right? So it's wasting money. You don't even want to buy an ad in a newspaper for that or an ad in a magazine for that, unless there's a specific magazine designed for people who like cowboy boots. And there actually is. But that aside, right, if you want to find people like that, you want to be able to demographically profile them. You want a record of their interests. Some of them might actually have expressed interest or done web searches for ostrich skin cowboy boots. And that's gold to anybody who's trying to sell anything. So what happens? Money moves from newspapers, magazines, television, and radio to Facebook and Google, the two companies that can do this thing right. That starves the public sphere as well. 
that starves journalism. So around the world, funding for journalism and therefore the quantity and quality of good journalism is going down because all the money's rushing out of that industry to Facebook and Google. And Facebook and Google are doing no favors for our general understanding of the condition of the world. Now here's something about scale. I know it's hard for the people in the back to read, so I'll, I'll explain it. But you can see how big the blue lines are. Um, so Facebook has about 2.2 billion users. This was as of July. It's bigger now. YouTube has 1.9 billion users. It's the only thing close. YouTube is owned by Google. The thing is, YouTube isn't really a social media service in the same way Facebook is. It has social functions, but nobody really uses it in the same way. So I'm, but it's really up there for comparison. Um, next comes WhatsApp. WhatsApp is a direct messaging service and a group messaging service owned by Facebook. It has about a billion and a half users. Next is Facebook Messenger, which you're kind of forced to use if you have a Facebook account. Has just over a billion users. Facebook Messenger, obviously owned by Facebook. Next comes WeChat, which is the largest social media platform in the People's Republic of China. Very few people outside of China use it. That's growing at a slow rate. And very few people in China use anything else. People in China live on this thing. That's how you pay for cabs. That's how you pay at vending machines. That's how you reserve library books. That's how you make doctor's appointments, all through WeChat. It is the operating system of their lives. It is what Facebook wishes it were. And Facebook is designing itself to be more like WeChat. A whole other story, you can read it in the book. Nonetheless, WeChat, you can sort of take that out of the list too because WeChat's all about China and nowhere else and Facebook's not allowed to be in China. Next comes Instagram, owned by Facebook, a billion users. So if you take out YouTube and you take out WeChat, you're left with Facebook, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and Instagram. Those are the only services in the world over a billion, with over a billion users, billion regular users, and they're all owned by Facebook. Nothing else is close. Twitter has only 330 million users, which is a big number for anything else, but you know, uh, a sixth of the users of Facebook. And it's not growing, it's actually shrinking. Fewer and fewer people use Twitter every month. Uh, Snapchat, about 300 million as well. Not growing, even if uh, it's actually a really good service. Um, it's, it's one of my preferred social media platforms. Um, but it's not really growing, and it doesn't have much penetration outside of North America and Western Europe. It's not available in a whole lot of languages. So, um, so really there's nothing else but Facebook. Oh, look, we're back. Hey, sorry. Good. Cool. All right. Now, this is Mark Zuckerberg's dream. Mark Zuckerberg's dream from the beginning was to bring the world together, to make us all understand each other better, to make food taste better. I don't know. That probably wasn't on the list. But look, his idea was that if you can actually get us talking, connected, if you can get us to be authentic, that was one of his favorite words early on, we, you know, we, we need to be authentic. We shouldn't hide things about ourselves, right? We shouldn't be private because that's inauthentic. We should all be out there letting everyone understand everything about us, or at least Facebook understand everything about us. We can be authentic. We can be out there. We can be connected. We won't have to fear each other once we understand each other. Everybody will hug, sing kumbaya. It'll be great. Thousands of years of human history notwithstanding, right? Somehow, Mark Zuckerberg missed the whole thing about like, people who had lived next to each other for centuries suddenly killing each other, which happens with some frequency on Earth. Somehow Mark Zuckerberg missed out on the varieties of human cruelty. Somehow Mark Zuckerberg missed out on the fact that communication does not work as a solvent for hatred, for bigotry, for animosity, for jealousy, for any of those things. It's not that simple. Mark Zuckerberg wants things to be that simple. And this is, you can see, 2016, not that long ago. This is his vision for what he wants to do. He is a social engineer. He's convinced that the more time you spend on Facebook, the more ways you use Facebook, the more reasons we have for Facebook, and the more often per day you, you, you log into Facebook, the better your life will be. And the better the world will be because somehow you will treat people better. Again, we have no evidence for that claim. All right. But what Facebook does, and this is really important, the reason that there are 2.2 billion people using Facebook, 
is that it brings value to them, to me. I use it, right? It's not, let's, let's not assume that 2.2 billion people are suckers or fools. They get value out of it. In fact, individually, Facebook is very good in general for most of those 2.2 billion users, or they would quit. Although it is difficult to in some parts of the world where, as I said, it is in many cases the only source of social connection and information. And I'll get to that in a little while. So why do we use Facebook? Well, to make sure we know what's up with our cousin's kids. You know, maybe our cousin's kid is valedictorian of, of her high school, right? Maybe our uh, best friend from high school got a new puppy, right? Maybe our friend from kindergarten, who we haven't actually talked to in 20 years, um, has decided to go to medical school, right? Something like, right? That, and that's a lovely thing that Facebook offers us. A, a sort of low cost, zero cost in many cases, frictionless way to keep up with people who are secondary or tertiary relations to us. Pre-Facebook, we had no problem keeping up with our siblings, with our parents, with our children, with our grandchildren. That's all in our primary circle of affection. That's all in our primary circle of relations. Those are the people you would send holiday cards to. Those are the people you would call on the phone when something important happens in your life, good or bad, right? Those are the people who might live next door to you or down the block, right? Those aren't the people Facebook is valuable for in terms of keeping you connected. It's the next and next and next level. And it's lovely. It's really, and I, I, if, you, if you're a, if you're a, a long-term Facebook user or a frequent Facebook user, you know that there are people you've reignited distant friendships, even if you just share a sense of humor, or you just share a political sensibility, or you just share an interest in Will Ferrell movies. Whatever it is, right, you've got something that you share with that person, and it's kind of nice. And that's really important. So the puppy photos are especially important. So this is actually a five-year-old picture, uh, but every year in October, which is when we adopted Butter, this is Butter, um, uh, uh, this picture shows up from the day we adopted her because it was, it was a major event in my life. It was a, probably a bigger event for her because she's so young. Uh, she didn't know it at the time that it was a big event. Um, and uh, yeah, she's much bigger now. Beautiful still. In fact, you can look her up. She's Golden Butter on Instagram. Golden butter, yeah, she's great, great Instagram feed. Um, so what happened is the first time I put this up, the day it happened, this was the biggest hit I had, of anything I'd ever put on Facebook for obvious reasons, right? Um, and uh, it generated hundreds of comments, lots of smiley faces and hearts, like all the reaction you want. This is the good stuff. This is why we use Facebook, right, for these moments in life. And to be reminded of these moments, because like as I said, this pops up every anniversary of this. So to Facebook, because I've been on using Facebook since 2006, maybe 2005, which was the year my daughter was born, um, uh, it does, there are no photographs of my wedding, which happened before that, no photographs of my daughter's birth, which, ha which happened in late 2005, and we didn't have iPhones at the time, so there was no easy way to post a photo to, fo to Facebook. In fact, Facebook didn't even host photos uh, back in those days. Um, and it was only available to the academic community. Um, so as far as Facebook's concerned, this is the most important thing that's ever happened in my life. Uh, because it's the only thing that has generated this kind of reaction. Um, but what does this mean? Uh, these sorts of events Facebook uses to manipulate us. It's not the worst kind of manipulation. Manipulation by puppy, you know, if you gotta be manipulated, it's pretty good. Um, but nonetheless, right, this is, this is a reminder of the good stuff. And Facebook constantly puts it back before us. Remember this really nice moment? Remember this lovely feeling? Remember when you posted this and you made everyone happy? Right? And it might be your kid's graduation photo. It might be your wedding photo. It might be the day you got a puppy. It might be the day you became a parent. Right? It might be the day you adopted a child. Right? Those, are the, those are the moments. And, and, but Facebook is constantly tracking that, too, because Facebook wants to get you back, wants you to think during the day, oh, I really need to check in to see if I got some sort of response to the thing I post. That scoreboard, see there's a little scoreboard notification six, right? If, you were, if I were to scroll lower, you would see just how many comments 
uh, and, and, uh, and emojis this thing has. That scoreboard prompts us like, like, we're, play, like we're in a casino, like we're playing with a, with a slot machine or fruit machine in the casino, right? Prompts us constantly to check back, to check how well uh, we are doing with this post, how popular we are. And that draws us back to Facebook in an almost addictive way. All right. So Facebook's advertising system is incredibly uh, successful. I've explained that already. The blue bar is revenue. You can see how quickly it's gone up between 2009, when it first started making money, and 2017, the last year I have a full numbers for. Um, so revenue, $40 billion, $40.6 billion. It's a whole lot of cash coming into a company that only has a few thousand employees. Uh, profits of almost $16 billion. It's because it costs a lot of money to run Facebook. Um, all those servers, all that security, et cetera. Um, and this is how the advertising system works. Um, you decide to buy an ad, and you narrow the audience to target the audience. So this particular ad is for, um, is for uh, 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 employment, right? This person is trying to find uh, someone to hire. Um, and this is pretty interesting. So this person has decided, starting from the entire United States, which has 220 million Facebook users, big number, 220 million, not as big as India, which has 250 million Facebook users, and that's only a quarter of the population of India. Um, but 220 million Facebook users in the US, you don't want to buy an ad for 220 million people, unless you're running for president or trying to sell beer or something, right? So, um, so you start narrowing it. So this person has decided, we're only going to show this ad in LA, in San Diego, in San Francisco, in Chicago, in New York, in Austin, in Seattle, and in Washington. I'm sorry, Seattle, Washington, right? So in Seattle. So basically high-tech cities, right? Uh, only people who have expressed interest in advertising or search engine marketing or pay-per-click or social media will get this ad. So that narrows it even more. Only people who currently have the job title of founder, CEO, or co-founder. So this person's probably looking for a CEO. So only those people get it. Now here's the thing that gets weird. Only single people will get this. That's weird, right? Probably illegal. Then only people within the ages of 24 and 32 will see this ad. Somehow, somewhere out there is a 24-year-old CEO who's, you know, um, which happens bizarrely, like Zuckerberg was one at some point. Um, so again, that is a suspect job ad under Equal Employment Opportunity Commission rules. And here's the big flag, only men will see this ad. Gender, male, totally illegal. And this happens on Facebook all the time. Job ads only go to men. Real estate ads only go to people of certain races. Happens all the time on Facebook. Because Facebook just gives you these categories, right? For, uh, for, cause look, they're trying to make it easy for you to target your ads. So, you know, if you are selling hair care products that primarily appeal to African American buyers, of course you don't want people who are uninterested in that hair care product seeing your ad because that's a waste of time and money for them. So you would, that would be a moment when picking a particular race would make sense. But you're talking about real estate, you're talking about jobs, that is totally illegal and immoral, right? And that's the kind of stuff that is allowed on Facebook's thing. So what you see here is, first of all, the dynamic of how Facebook ads work and why it's so appealing to advertisers. Because you only get to hit the people that you think are going to be interested in your ad. Um, but why it's so troublesome? Because you can discriminate in some nasty ways. I still don't know. Like, this is a, I picked this up off a site with a bunch of examples of suspect job ads. It's just bizarre to me that this person wants, like only wants, well, it's actually not that bizarre. People often just want to hire men. We know that, right? But it's just, it's so over the top. Um, yeah, so the ad system, of course, was easily hacked, easily uh, hijacked by Russians who wanted to interfere with our election. Uh, but even domestically, as I said, the US got off easy in this situation. Uh, in 2014, Narendra Modi, who was running for Prime Minister of India, first used Facebook effectively as a political candidate. He was the person who really set the template, invented the ways, the system, to use Facebook effectively. Not coincidentally, Narendra Modi runs a party 
and a political movement that is explicitly nationalistic and very bigoted and very violent. Um, and his political party has consistently called for violence against Muslims, has sparked violence against Muslims, uh, and, uh, and he's, you know, he is, uh, uh, he is, his entire political career has been about putting Hindus in power. Um, so he found out in 2014 that Facebook and WhatsApp are great for stirring up hatred, for stirring up whatever latent hatred is out there, for creating new animosity, for creating fear, for creating moral panic. And every month I see a story coming out of India about mob violence against people, often low caste people who are accused of uh, slaughtering cows for food, which may or may not be true. It doesn't matter if it's true because it's on WhatsApp or it's on Facebook and people believe it's true and so they kill somebody over it, right? Because to high caste Hindus, anybody who slaughters uh, cows or cattle for food is committing a grave sin. So that's a big problem. And there are often uh, pogroms against mu communities of Muslims. There are often lynchings, literal <laughs> lynchings of, of uh, Christian missionaries throughout India. Uh, it's a very dangerous place right now, and much of the hatred is being spread uh, through Facebook and WhatsApp. And as you can see, Mark Zuckerberg loves this guy because he is the most popular Facebook politician in the world. He has more Facebook followers than any other politician. But coming up right behind him is Rodrigo Duterte, the current president of the Philippines, who in 2016 ran a very similar campaign uh, with very similar themes. And he, you know, like, like, like Modi and Trump, do not hide what they want to do to people. He does not hide what, they want, what he wants to do to people. He ran for president saying, I will unleash vigilante violence on people and have extrajudicial killings of anyone who is suspected of selling drugs. And that's exactly what's happened. And thousands of people have been gunned down in the streets ever since he's been president with no recourse, no justice, no oversight. Facebook put staff in his campaign to help him win too. Uh, and he has had number, a number of high-level meetings with Facebook staff. Um, Facebook's actually in a deal currently with the Philippine government that he runs to lay fiber optic, fiber optic cable in Manila Bay so that the Philippines becomes the center of telecommunications for Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. Um, they're very close, right? So even though Rodrigo Duterte basically said, when I'm president, there will be blood running in the streets. Facebook went, yeah, I'll help you. What can I do? Same thing with Modi. Same thing, same thing with Trump. Facebook is growing every place but North America and Western Europe, where it's kind of flatlined. And one of the ways it's growing is by offering a free service called Free Basics. So, you know, in much of the world, data on one's phone is super expensive relative to the money people have. Uh, and so for many years, there's been this big gap, large swaths of the world where people cannot get ex access to high-speed data, therefore can't do all of the things that a small business might want to do using a phone. You know, uh, run spreadsheets, um, create mailing lists. Uh, and of course, we're talking about environments where there was no landline system effectively before, where PCs are uh, cumbersome, you know, laptops are rare and undependable and outdated. So a constantly updated phone is actually a really good way to, uh, to help run one's life. So Zuckerberg started uh, this, uh, Facebook started this uh, uh, philanthropic wing called internet.org and they created a suite of applications called Free Basics. And they went around the world to developing nations and they cut deals with telecommunication companies like, like the AT&Ts and the Sprints and the Verizons of these different countries. And they said, you know what? If you will let low-income people uh, buy your phone that has free basics on it, when people use free basics, the suite of applications on free basics, it won't count against their data plans and we will subsidize it. This is a great way to get lots of people, billions of people it turns out, signed up to Facebook because if you're using Facebook or WhatsApp, and they also have apps that lead to Wikipedia and apps that lead to agricultural advice sites and maternity care sites, et cetera, um, if you use that suite of apps, then you can just keep using your phone even after your data plan runs out. You might not even have to buy a data plan. So what's happened in places like Myanmar, in places like the Philippines, in places like Cambodia, 
Kenya, Nigeria, in about 40 countries, is that people now exclusively use Facebook. Facebook becomes the entire information ecosystem in many of these places. Not coincidentally, every country I just mentioned has massive problems with ethnic violence or sectarian violence. The worst case being Myanmar. Myanmar is a site of genocide. It's the site of genocide that is almost entirely amplified and spread by Facebook. And it's done so with direct, uh, a direct propaganda effort from the government and from some high-level Buddhist monks. And it's against the Rohingya minority, which, who are predominantly Muslim. They predominantly live in the western part of the country, and they're being driven out, driven into refugee camps in Bangladesh and India, where they're not met with open arms. So they're pretty miserable, and they're dying at a high rate. It's a terrible and extreme example of the damage that can be done with Facebook. None of these examples of hatred, animosity, bigotry are because of Facebook. They all predate Facebook, but they are amplified by Facebook. Facebook is a performance-enhancing drug for these movements and these passions, and it's not made the world better or safer as a result. So um, Zuckerberg has a bigger vision. He wants to dominate the development of artificial intelligence, the ability for machines to predict what we might want. And he wants to dominate the rollout of virtual reality, uh, a, a way that we might engage with each other and engage with fantasy through a controlled system. In fact, he, his company bought the most promising consumer version of virtual reality, consumer uh, 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 hardware for virtual reality, uh, a set called Oculus Rift, which you can soon buy. You'll probably actually start seeing ads for it this holiday season. You know, it's for gaming, or it's for pornography, or it's for uh, therapy, it's for medicine, it's for training. You know, pilots are trained on virtual reality, surgeons are trained on virtual reality. But imagine if the company that knows so much about everybody is the dominant player in virtual reality, where we check in to dream, and we check in to fantasize, and we check in to train ourselves. That is a tremendous amount of power. So this is the future we face if Facebook remains as dominant and powerful as it has been, if it grows in power, which it very, could well, very well could be. Now, it's had a really rough year, and it's finally in the sights of regulators. In fact, just uh, the other day, uh, Facebook officials faced grilling from seven different governments at once over all sorts of issues, privacy issues and, and breakdowns in security and the, the proliferation of propaganda and hate speech. All of these are issues. People are finally paying attention. I wish I could say it's because of my book. It's actually a coincidence. So we might actually see some pressure. But the problem is Facebook doesn't have a lot of pressure points. There aren't a lot of ways to address this problem. There aren't a lot of regulatory interventions that we can imagine pressing on Facebook. I would love to see Facebook broken up. I would love to see antitrust employed to break off WhatsApp and break off Instagram so they're independent companies. And the data doesn't all feed into one big pile of data. And the advertising systems compete against each other. And as people decide that Instagram has better puppies, people start using Instagram more, and it actually undermines Facebook in the market. That's not happening right now. People are using Instagram more, but Facebook makes the same money. And they don't care. And the ultimate goal of Facebook, by the way, is to merge all these platforms so that eventually WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger are the same platform and Instagram and Facebook are the same platform. So even if you're saying to yourself, and I know some of you are like, I don't ever use Facebook. I'm all about Instagram. Well, guess what? Soon you will be on Facebook whether you like it or not. And as I said, Snapchat isn't long for this world. Uh, Zuckerberg has his eye on crushing Snapchat pretty fast, and it pro he probably will. Uh, by the way, this is a photo that Facebook itself put out, its communication department put out, because for some reason they thought this was some sort of positive image. But I think it's scary as heck. Um, anyway, that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I made you sad. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. And remember, there's some sort of special prize, right?
mics here in the audience. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, so if you have a question, feel free to make your way to the mic. Hi. Hello. Um, any commentary or insights about uh, the social fabric influences of Facebook uh, contributing to isolation, uh, our attention span shortening, uh, maybe information overload, so we're more reliant on algorithms to process information because right, right. we're just flooded? So I looked through a lot of that literature when I was writing the book, and I decided not to make it my thing um, for a couple of reasons. One, I don't understand that area of scholarship very well, so I was in no position to judge whether a study was um, reliable or not. So a study that, and I've seen a number of studies that say, you know, consistent use of Facebook uh, lowers um, one's affective state, the, basically your sense of happiness. There are a number of studies that have said that. Um, I don't know how to judge those studies, and I don't know how many have been replicated, so I didn't want to deploy that in my work. It's just not a field I feel I can judge well. But be aware that there are a lot of studies on those sorts of questions, the mental health and general um, well-being of excessive uh, social media use, specifically Facebook use. Um, and if you're interested, then you know, ask a librarian. They'll guide you through the literature and sift through the good stuff and the bad stuff in ways that I couldn't. So I just didn't feel I was qualified to talk about that. But one thing that I did write about, and I do care a lot about, is the ways in which using Facebook as a medium for what we hope to be actual deliberation about important issues, and we all try, that Facebook is very poorly designed for that. Facebook is really well designed for motivation. So if you want to uh, launch a political movement, no matter your political orientation, Facebook is a really effective platform for that because it does exactly what you want to, for, for motivating people to, to, uh, to be politically active. You can sort through and find people of like mind, right? people who agree with you about an issue. You can find the people who are highly motivated about that issue, and you can ask them to show up at a certain place in a certain time, or to join a Facebook group and share some information. right? So it's really effective at that sort of activity. Great for motivation, terrible for deliberation. And I want people to understand that democratic republics require both deliberation and motivation. You cannot live by one alone. And right now, in the United States of America, we're all about motivation, and we have very, fewer and fewer opportunities to deliberate. Hi. Did Facebook do enough to prevent Russia from interfering? Oh, in absolutely. <laughs> so I mean, are they, yeah. they going to be back at it at 2000? Yeah, well, so, I mean, um, right. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Facebook, like the TSA, is really good at working on the last threat, right? The last attack, right? So remember, you know, you take your shoes off at the airport because of something that one person tried to do in 2003, right? And like did once. We don't know if there's ever been a person since then who's tried to put explosives in a shoe. Um, but because that one person did and tried to light it on fire, um, that's why we all take our shoes off. So that's I mean, TSA is really good at like looking back and saying that was the last threat. Facebook's the same way. And a lot of security is just based on that, right? Um, uh, so this last year, Facebook has been tracking very effectively posts that had been, um, that originated in, with IP numbers that come from either the Soviet, the former Soviet Union, the former Soviet states, or Russia. Um, and that's real easy. But look, in 2016, they weren't following that at all. They just let it all go. They knew about it. There were people working at Facebook going, hey, there's a problem as early as 2014. There were people within Facebook warning as, as well as they could that there were um, Russian forces, Russian agents trying to affect elections around the world. Estonia, Ukraine, of course, and then Brexit. And nobody in the upper echelons of Facebook wanted to take it seriously or to talk about it publicly. So that was a big problem. So people at Facebook knew about that, but they couldn't get the people who run things to, pay, to care or to think it was a serious problem. Only when there was blowback after the 2016 election, only when the US government got involved in investigating the uh, effects of Russia on our democracy did Facebook finally own up to the fact that it, it totally let that go. But now it is, of course, screening for that. But the Russians aren't dumb. They know that they shouldn't be buying ads and launching groups from those IP numbers in St. Petersburg. So what they do is they 
um, have people who work for them, who live in the United States, launch all these Facebook groups. So um, there, there's all sorts of shenanigans going on. There's also very strong connections between a lot of what the GRU and other Russian intelligence groups want to do with propaganda and the alt-right. The alt-right groups in the United States are very well in, uh, uh, coordinated with Russian propaganda because they share many of the ideological uh, affiliations. I mean, they're, 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 they're often ethno-nationalists in Russia. Uh, they're very anti-gay. Uh, and uh, and there's, a, there's a real sense that you know, this sort of anti-globalist feeling is widely shared. So basically, Russia doesn't have to do anything directly anymore. Um, much of the threat that we see with, uh, with uh, uh, propaganda uh, that affects the United States is actually coming domestically now. Uh, and a lot of it's domestically funded, too. Uh, and I actually, I, as we look back on the last few years, I think that's a bigger threat, ultimately, if you're talking just about what's going on on Facebook. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Hi. So I heard you talking, because I didn't know this, um, Facebook owns WhatsApp. Yep. So you were talking how now they're purchasing different like sectors, so now it's kind of like... Um, conglomerate. Do you think Bezos doing the same thing where yeah. he purchased Whole Foods? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so Amazon, of course, works in completely different areas of life. But you think about what Jeff Bezos wants, his megalomania, his desire to run everything isn't so different from what Mark Zuckerberg does, wants. But they have a very important difference. Jeff Bezos has never said, I'm going to improve the human species. He's basically said, I want to make more money than anybody else. And I kind of respect that in the sense, like he's just, he just says like, I want to sell stuff, I want to destroy every other business, every bookstore in the world, right? I mean, I don't approve, but you got to kind of respect the honesty. Um, and by buying Whole Foods, that's basically getting into a way to crush a lot of other food delivery systems um, and a lot of other, uh, uh, you know, uh, food retail systems. Um, so, uh, yeah, like Bezos has never had the pretensions of trying to save the world. Um, he just wants to have more of everything, and he does. The thing that they share is they both want ultimately to control the data. They want to each run the operating system of our lives. And they're having, they have different strategies for it. So you, you might have noticed that this year Facebook put out its, its home, its home uh, uh, appliance. Right, we've had the Alexa for a couple of years, uh, Google Home for a couple of years, right? The little, the, the weird uh, obelisk that sits on our desk, like something out of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, and of course, it listens to us kind of like the microphone's always on, it's always recording what we say in our homes and then sending it to the mothership for constant processing. It's a really like alarming thing that we keep bringing into our homes for some reason. So Facebook now is offering one that is a video service, but does the same thing. Constantly listening to you, constantly recording, sending the messages to Facebook, but it will make a video connection with any of your Facebook friends who also have this service. Um, so if you think about the fact that Google's trying to do it, and is doing it, and Amazon's doing it in the home, and Facebook's doing it in the home, they're all trying to master the flow of data in your home, and ultimately in your car, in your fridge, on your body, um, often this notion that there will be data flowing through everything, everything will be monitored, everything will be monetized, everything will be guided. We, uh, we hear the phrase, the Internet of Things, describing this phenomenon. I think that's a really bad phrase because it's not like the Internet. The Internet is open and configurable and any of us can build something on the Internet. This is a highly proprietary set of devices and networks. But it's also, most importantly, not about things. What they're building is about us, is about human bodies and human decisions. Uh, and what we're doing as we invite, you know, smart watches, which aren't that smart, um, and these, you know, these devices into our lives and cars that are constantly hooked up to some sort of central server, you know, like the Tesla. As we do this, we are outsourcing decision making. We're, we're allowing some other force to algorithmically advise us and drive us and move us to make certain decisions, consumer decisions or, or navigational decisions or nutritional decisions uh, or, um, or exercise decisions, right? We're constantly asking for some computer somewhere to tell us what to do. Um, 
and we spend a lot of money to outsource decisions. And it happens so incrementally that you know, we kind of lose sight of it because we're constantly after convenience. At some point, we decided convenience is the most important thing in the world. I don't know how that happened, but it outweighs all other values. Amazon key. I'm sorry? Amazon key. Yeah, Amazon key, the perfect example, right? Something that just, I need more Tide, I need more Minute Maid, right? And you notice that the Amazon keys are often tied to particular products. Those are deals cut between Amazon and those products, and those suppliers, right? Procter & Gamble or Kellogg's, right? And that is something that Amazon cuts a deal and make sure everything is like instantly given to you at a discount. But you as the consumer is like, oh, the easy thing is just buy Tide instead of shopping around for the best deal in detergent or whatever, right? Um, so you just go, boom, I got my Tide coming. Maybe buy drones soon, right? I mean, when Amazon starts delivering things by drones, think how lazy we're all gonna be. But more importantly, think of the poor dogs, right? This is gonna terrify dogs all over the world, um, and it's probably gonna like fascinate children in some dangerous ways. But anyway, that's a whole drone thing. Yeah, so I think we need to be concerned about this notion that one, two, or three companies will uh, essentially be the operating system of our lives and will, in a soft, almost invisible way, guide us and drive us and determine for us what we put in our bodies and on our bodies and what, where we move our bodies. That's where we're headed. And we seem to be doing it willingly and spending hundreds and thousands of dollars every holiday season to make sure we're there faster. It's bizarre. Anyway. Thank you. I got a lot of rants and sermons. <laughs> Very few of them are happy. Sorry. Well, if you have other questions, we'll invite you to share over the reception and the book signing. But if you'll join me all in thanking our speaker one more time. Thank you.